to the club. How's it going? Hey. Hi, Tom. So nice meeting every one of you. Uh, well, actually, um, thank you for finding time. And let me do a quick presentation, uh, you know, kind of introduction, and then um, I think we'll um, uh, uh, hand the microphone to uh, Arthur to, to bring in some data on Anthony's journey as well. And basically, uh, the overall goal for this conversation is to understand how can we be helpful in both directions. Right now, we are using the data provided by your, your team, guys. And uh, we, being an organization of more than 900 volunteers, we believe that we can do more for each other. And basically, we are looking for some strategic, potentially, collaboration. And that's something we would like to discuss later on this call. So um, yeah, here on this call from, from uh, the coronavirus side, Arthur, the founder, and uh, mm -hmm. Anton, um, Anton Polishko, right? Uh, he's a sort of CTO. Yeah. He's uh, overseeing the technical teams. Then uh, Daniel, he's actually representing communication team, mostly as far as I'm saying, though he's playing much, much more role than that. And Anton's out of me. Uh, I am actually helping the team to build partnership with other companies and organizations. So I, yeah, would you like guys to present, to, to, to do a quick introduction on your end as well? Uh, okay, hey, uh, I'm Kyle. Uh, I'm a researcher and this Max Scholar team at AI2. Um, and I'm, I guess, like the one of two, the, me and Lucy Wong, who's not on the call, um, are sort of like co-creators of the Core19 uh, okay. data sets. Um, and uh, right now, our, we're just maintaining it. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Is, it, is it like only two of you from the institutes and uh, who is focusing on, the, on these projects? There's, there's a lot of things like so the scope of okay. it is, is quite broad. So um, there is a large effort for just the specific data set itself. So like the, the provision of the data set, answering questions about it and, and the curation, maintenance and any updates to data set. Um, mm -hmm. Those fall under me and Lucy and then the people we work with. Um, Tom is a good person to talk to uh, who is doing a lot of downstream applications building on top of the data set. So like Tom has mm -hmm. like a really cool visualization tool for relations and, okay. and um, is working on other projects sort of consuming, uh, consuming the data set. So that's like another good direction to also look into. Perfect. Yeah. But, uh, but to, to understand, I'm not sure I understood properly. Um, so do you mean that there are only two people, yourself and Lucy, who are working on the data, data set and from the institute end? There are, there are a lot of people working on the okay, data set. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's There's the a, one to know. Yeah, okay. How big is the team, you know? Perfect. Tom? The t yeah. Hey, Tom. Kyle, you were going to say something? Oh, no, I think we're waiting for your oh, yeah, introduction. You could, yeah. yeah, quickly introduce a little bit. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, so uh, I'm Tom. I'm doing a postdoc um, at UW and the Allen Institute. Um, before that, I also led a research team in industry at uh, Intel Corporation. Um, and working generally on boosting creativity and discovery and scientific innovation. The first tool we developed recently uh, is pretty simple, but it visually looks nice. Um, it's the COVID thing, which uh, you may have seen. Uh, I, think I, may, I think I sent it to you. And more importantly, we're working on extending it in all kinds of ways, basically a lot more knowledge, a lot more ability to explore and discover and, and features uh, to boost discovery and uh, I can elaborate uh, a bit further later. And I'm very curious and also other people at AI2 like our manager Dan Weld and other people curious to hear what the Kegglers see as important uses of people just building more and more search engines on top of this. That's what Dan asked me, you wanted me to ask you actually? <laughs> Or is, this, is someone actually using this? Um, and what uses do you see? And uh, just understand from your uh, perspective. Thanks. Okay, cool. So uh, Arthur, would you like to kind of provide some vision to this conversation before yeah, it starts I, on the agenda? I think, 
uh, and again, thanks a lot for jumping in on, on the call. And we can't emphasize how much you guys did for like emergen emergency of whatever we call organization here. As you can see in the past three weeks, we now have, you know, communication teams, you know, technical teams, uh, the, the partnership teams and things like that. It's quite surreal. And I still can't believe that this is happening. But uh, yeah, like Kaggle and you guys being the uh, creators of the Core 19, you basically started it all. So um, thanks a lot for that. And I think like what has to happen is basically us kind of getting in sync on how to be the most useful to e each other and figuring out these specific channels uh, of, you know, kind of value transfer for, for each of the teams. And obviously we have such an immense resource in, in terms of engaged people, not just, you know, people that exist on Kaggle, but the ones that are willing to do hard work and actually, you know, do crazy complex things. And we've just <clears throat> finished the submissions yesterday for four of the uh, tasks. Not sure if you guys had a chance to explore them, but they're beyond, you know, the, just building a search engine. There was such a crazy amount of work that was uh, put into it. And the outcome is basically creative redundancy in all the potential ways how we can use Core 19 and even go beyond because we truly believe we're, we're stumbling upon new ways to kind of search for data and make use of data within the, the current scope of the project. So, you know, the, the short term goal is obviously Kaggle challenge and helping research community fight COVID-19, but we're already exploring the things beyond that which we claim to call, you know, data science for good, which is essentially what you guys are, are focusing on. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. The, the vision in, in the quick intro. I, I, just to, I just wanted to clarify, you know, building a search engine is very complicated. So when, 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 when uh, and very challenging. So when I said that Dan asked the people just building search engine, it's not the just means, right. Is that the only thing? And not okay, simple. Well, it's the, and, yeah. and, and importantly, you know, how do people use them? Okay, because are we just focusing on just making the information accessible, or do we know how it's useful? And that can also help guide what kind of information yeah, we give and, people. And that's exactly what we're trying to, you know, crack the code in. And basically, we have you know, a lot of these epidemiologists, medical experts, MDs that work for, with like Google AI lab, worked on diabetes prediction, on SARS epidemic, geospatial analysis, and all kinds of super smart people with, uh, you know, the best credentials we can ask for. Uh, but we still haven't figured out the actual product for them to, to make use of. And we, you know, the first submissions are basically a glimpse of that, you know, wrong answer for them to see and be like, oh, hey, you know, this is useful or this doesn't make any sense. So we're, we're trying to integrate the medical community and research community into our current process and figure out the, you know, next step for us. Are the Kaggle, then, are the Kaggle tasks actually, oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask oh, if, the, if the Kaggle ahead. tasks are actually useful to anyone. So or here's, is it just... here's a big piece of learning. That's a great question. I think they were useful for as the initial structure to organize people around things. So I'm not sure if you were following the, the very beginning of, uh, you know, Corona Y, but we made a, an amazing, um, you know, kind of uh, attempt into figure out which tasks are the most useful. So we crowdsourced the prioritization of tasks and we uh, figured out the top three, uh, top three, four that made the most impact or it like could lead to the most impact, have the most data presence, have the most specific, you know, explanation, what has to be uh, understood, uh, were, you know, easy enough for the two, three week uh, period. And that was basically our first attempt. So I think they were super useful in terms of creating this momentum. But then once we started working on them, we realized how, you know, general, unspecific they are for us to actually produce some meaningful outputs. 
So that's when we start integrating MDs input, physicians input, epidemiologists, and just basically trying to build up the knowledge base. For example, I'll, I'll take the risk factors um, as, as an example task. The Kegel uh, task lists out like smoking, some pulmonary diseases and something else, like just a couple of those. But in reality, there are so many of these risk factors. So the first step we did, we basically listed out all the potential uh, risk factors. We uh, did a preliminary search uh, to understand which data is represented in the core 19 in terms of just an amount of papers to understand what to focus on, what's possible. And then we took the MD input and actually prioritize the things that through their prism make the most impact. And that's how we you know, establish this me methodology of kind of like pulling pieces from different places, creating engrams, creating some uh, crazy complex structures to bring some, something valid, or at least we hope something valid. To, to, to Dan's point around like, is it, is it just, and I, and I get what you mean about just search engines, not in terms of minimizing what those are, but in terms of, of the entire pipeline that's necessary for it to actually have an impact. Um, and to just say that, that that's one of the things that Cornell Library really is focusing on is not simply building the tools um, and not just bringing in medical experts to help us refine them, but we're very interested in figuring out both how we can be talking to the organizations and the experts who help us know what we should be pointing at and we're interested in trying to do the liaising out to make sure that the right people are getting access to the findings that come out the other side. So rather than just that discrete little piece of doing the data analysis, little piece, but the discrete piece of doing the data analysis, we really are trying to figure out how do we bridge between the data that's there and then actual action on the grounds that has an impact. Does it answer your question, Tom? Yeah, it does. Uh, also, I think we skipped some intros uh, due to this uh, discussion, so maybe. Oh, we can, yeah. oh actually, actually, I, I tried to do the intro for 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 the Corona White team, but yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, sorry for that. If, if this was no, I don't. Whatever, whatever, just, whatever you want. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, actually, yeah. L let me just repeat quickly. Uh, Arthur is the founder of Corona White Initiative. He started this as a, his private idea and it's oh, yeah, uh, like 900 people right? I, yeah i got i got That's that part of the intro i thought maybe right, right. we're if individual intro sorry okay cool. oh if you if you need it sure you know would you like to guys to to do a short one it's, it's fine fine Are you sure yeah, okay. I mean, we, we have 15 more uh, or is it an hour call we have actually yeah it's an hour call oh, i just okay. wanted to make sure that we, we have enough time to discuss everything yeah so, so to give you a, a intro, yeah a quick intro into my background. I am an engineer, have degree in systems of artificial intelligence, but I turned to entrepreneurship and I had uh, successful and, and failed startups across my career. And then I turned to a co found venture studio here in LA. And basically, that's a mix between the startup incubator and consultancy. And for the past um, six years, I've been basically uh, putting out eight, 10 startups per year and helping them reach product market fit. And meanwhile, focusing on AI and machine learning as the primary kind of unfair advantage to equip uh, these startups with. So that's kind of wh where I'm coming from in terms of I had experience working with these kind of un highly uncertain environments. And that's what I think made Corona Y happen because the task was unclear. There was no clear structure to follow, but there was some glimpse of it. And I was able to synthesize that and basically equip uh, hardcore machine learning engineers to start working on something. So that's me. Yeah, so, so, so I'm, I'm uh, Daniel. I'm up in Vancouver, BC. Uh, I'm founder of a company called Banging Rocks, where we do VR for positive social impact. So we're working a lot with the arts, working a little bit with meditation, moving from there into compassion training and therapeutics and education. So, um, within that context, I also work at the University of British Columbia's Emerging Media Lab as a, as a VR AR development lead there. Um, and it was actually through that um, that I got together a small student project team uh, to, to work on, on the Core 19 data. And it was in, in doing that that we, that we found out about Corona Y and what Arthur was starting up and so I got involved there. So I'm, I'm coming kind of from that side of things. The other piece for me is that I'm also coming from a facilitation background dealing with communities and especially dealing with 
uh, emergent communities and pattern languages around group dynamics and how you put things together for that. So, um, so the kind of structure that Corona Y is, uh, is, is the kind that I'm, I'm fascinated by and love kind of tinkering with. Okay. It was awesome to hear uh, Daniel's background first time for me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> new, new information. Yeah. Um, happy, happy we could help. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so my name is Ed, Anton. Um, I'm originally from Ukraine. I got applied math degree from like uh, Trichenko University, one of the top schools of, of, of my country. Uh, 2009, I moved to United States and I went through PhD program in computer science at the University of California, Riverside. I was doing research in the field of like epigenetics. So I was working with biologists uh, who produce high throughput sequencing data. And since I'm, I'm coming from like math, computer science background, I was building models how to extract different dependencies from high throughput sequencing data. Uh, published a couple of papers, packaged them in thesis, graduated 2014, and then I kind of like, you know, academia is cool, but it sounds very similar to what startups are about, and I really like startups, <laughs> etc. So 2014, I kind of like out of school, fresh out of school, AI wave is, you know, going, all of that cool stuff. So I jumped uh, right into that space. So uh, I did a couple of startups. Again, most of them were like failures as, as they expected to be. Um, my usually role is just like this, first engineer, like first like dozen engineers in the company, maybe sometimes a CTO or something, depending on how early I kind of get into to the mix. Um, and like I joined Corona Y with the simple goal of like, you know what? I'm an AI ML guy, but don't have exactly good like NLP experience. I want to try it out. And uh, here we are. Um, and right now I'm like, essentially CTO is a really generous description by Anton, <laughs> like more of a like technical and coordinator, or I call myself janitor. I'm simply picking up, you know, technical pieces that are falling over. Uh, and also we already assemble like a really powerful NLP team. So I'm learning from them. So it's that that's the type of thing I'm doing for Corona Y. I'll just quickly say also that Anton is very modest and that he he's doing a tremendous amount of stuff around Corona Y from, from the from the, the vision side of things to that CTO side to doing all of that that data janitorial side. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, let me do a quick intro on my end as well. Basically, I'm also originating from Ukraine, as the rest of two guys, Arthur and um, um, Anton. Uh, and we didn't know each other before this initiative. And uh, I am coming from IT services industries. I, I've done a couple of startups in my past, none of them successful. And I used to actually lead one of the delivery centers of, of a big uh, IT services company in Ukraine. And then two years ago, I moved to, to the U.S. And uh, yeah, here the current job seems to be less excited to me right now. And that's why I'm, I'm, I started looking for some something I would be excited about in terms of what I'm doing. That, that's why I asked around what, whether they need, they need volunteers for some, for some initiatives. And given the situation, my friend introduced me to Arthur like virtually one week ago. And I joined, I, I believe that I can help with putting things together, structuring things. I, I am not a data scientist. I can talk about it a little bit, not at all at the depth these guys do. But yeah, I, 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 I'm hoping to contribute in terms of kind of um, building more efficient and maybe coordinated and maybe um, uh, goal-driven team in the end, uh, in long-term perspective. Thank you. So I think we've done introductions and you know, when planning this conversation, we put together uh, a short agenda to start with, right? We have we originally had four questions. First of all, as far as I understand, right? Um, Kyle, um, according to the web page, you, you, your name was put into. You are the, the person who is going to be coordinating the question, questions and answers for these data sets. And I know that we, we've done some question uh, um, kind of uh, collection exercise on, on Corona Y end. And I remember Daniel, your name was there. So do we 
after all these rounds and circles, do we still need help uh, from uh, AA2 team to answer some of the questions? Do we have enough questions to uh, kind of schedule a separate session for that? And then from maybe. Yeah, and that's a good question. I know that we've had a few people who have been asking, hey, are we able to have that, that Q&A session with, uh, with AI2? Uh, beyond that, I don't know, Arthur, if you know. Yeah, anything. I think it's still a valid uh, request. We just need to kind of catch up to the, you know, to the things that we should be asking. And that is primarily dependent on, mm -hmm. you know, the outcome of this call in terms of, like, we've had a lot of different, you know, issues that we explored within the core 19 that you know we feel that there was some you know lack of resources or lack of time to you know uh, help with uh, within the ai2 space and we essentially created this um kind of the corona y core 19 data set which is a giant enriched data set which I'm not sure even if half of that data is, uh, you know, relevant or applicable, but it so far uh, was very valuable for different NLP exploration tasks and even adding the UMLS column, unified medical labeling system mm -hmm. uh, column was very helpful or named entity recognition stuff, uh, some lemmatized vectors and things like that. So just having, um, I think, a conversation in terms of are you guys planning to add those columns? Uh, like, it, do you have a resource to explore the, the scope of to which we should be enriching this data set and just having some, some more efficient communication, I think would, would be okay. a, a good Q&A session. Yeah, makes sense. So, so Kyle, oh, go ahead. Is there, yeah, is there, on your end, is there any preference in terms of the time and days for the meeting, like early next week? Um, so that we could, just put it together, like maybe Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, hmm. 10 Any other to, day, we'll work it too. 10 to 11? Oh, 10 to 11 PST? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, 10 you're, you're, muted. you're muted there, Roger. Uh, I was just saying that um that that's when we have the daily call but we can push it so ah, uh okay also any time after 4 p.m psd hopefully not going too late uh okay. let's do 10. Okay. yeah yeah okay let, let's let's take uh 4 p.m pst just as option b just in, in case you are not able to bring a lot of people because of the time restriction perfect so the second question on the agenda was you know i remember that uh, I know that uh, the Corona Y team actually took the data sets from the IA2 site and they enriched it widely. Like, I don't remember the exact numbers, like for six to 20 gigabytes. And uh, the question to you guys was whether this enriched data set might be useful for you to expose to other kind of uh, teams, you know? And that's probably, I don't know who's the right person to give more details here, Arthur and Anton maybe. Anton? So again, like right now, I view that enriched data set kind of again, more of an intermediate data set that our internal teams are using. Mm -hmm. But in terms of kind of question to you guys at uh, AI2 is simply some of that data obviously will probably useful only for us, but some of that is, you know, could be useful for others. We, in, in fact, like we're planning to open that up for other people to kind of call our API to kind of get those quarters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, like I see this natural, like organic way for us to communicate. So not only we kind of get in core 19 data set into us version seven right now, next week will be probably right V V8 and so on. But in a sense to kind of do it a two way now, and mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of the opening. So um, with respect to essentially data set augmentations, so like derivations of our data, um, there's been a lot of, I've, I've been discussing this a lot with, with sort of the, the, the media team. Um, it's tough. So it's, it's, it's tough in the sense of, we would really have to pick and choose which elements get added in. Um, and the decisions are pretty much based off these are things we've started thinking about since uh, there are also other groups such like yourself, uh, but we are also in contact with other groups who have 
also have like their own versions of enriched data uh, mm -hmm. and are wondering, and we're basically trying to figure out what's a good process for figuring out what types of things should sort of make their way into sort of an official AI2 sanctioned release. Um, yeah, essentially the main major decision boils down to if we add something, we have to maintain it. And mm -hmm. Uh, we want the data set to be as stable and predictable as possible. So if we add something uh, and we want to fix it later, and that requires like a, a large schema change or some sort of just essentially something fundamentally different changes about the data, it'll break everyone's code. Uh, yeah. If they're not like... Yes, it does every Friday. <laughs> yes, yes. We're, we're like, it's, it's going to be, it's going to get really crazy. This week should be hopefully stable. Next Friday is going to be like, it's going to be a, a shit show um, because we're ingesting, I think we're about to double the data set size uh, with, with new sources um, and we're moving towards daily updates. So here's the thing, we um, see that every week and we're trying to figure out how to help you. And I'm not sure if there is an organizational level type of support or any type of you know, commitment that has to be done uh, by our members. But like, who, who's the best person to um, kind of understand those, those type of potential relationships? Because obviously you do want to maintain the stability and it really relies on the commitment of individuals. And mm -hmm. we are a global volunteering group and you know, some people commit to 24 seven uh, type of work and some people come in for 30 minutes. Yeah. So, we are pretty good at assessing that and have a structure in place to facilitate commitment and engagement. Yeah. And we need just a little bit more input from your point of view. And yeah. Yeah, so, so what we're sort of leaning towards, um, at least like this is sort of what Lucy and I are leaning towards, um, we're still debating this discussion sort of, uh, is uh, I think ultimately we have to make a decision, uh, like a, a small group, um, has to make a decision as to whether we go forward or don't go forward with particular changes, especially anything that could be uh, like code breaking, like a schema change or um, some fundamental new data source or something like that. Let me ask um, you a quick question. Do you guys have any automated type of tasks or anything? What do you mean automated tasks? Like to, to make sure that the, the new data set is stable or how do you guys check that? This is, uh, this is the thing, it's we, make changes we have tests to check if the data set is stable under party schema but then the changes that we're making that breaks things aren't unintentional they are intentional changes where we describe in the change log that this is this is what happened and it probably will break everyone's things um but they're like purposeful decisions not necessarily things that we accidentally didn't see and it broke it do, do you know what i mean like yeah, the exception true. is maybe the duplicate cord uid thing that was one thing that we didn't expect to happen. Um, but even then, uh, we're like essentially still debating as to what's the proper way to go through with this and because- Let so. me ask you this, what serves as a framework for decision-making on this purposeful modification? Is that you and Lucy or? Yeah, it's mostly uh, uh, me and Lucy doing this and the, it's essentially motivated by um, we have, we worked on a project over the course of a year around how to release large scale uh, full text corpora such as this. Um, and so a lot of the code that we're using and sort of the way that we're thinking about designing and maintaining Core 19 is motivated by the, the work we did for, for this larger and, project. And is that an open source or uh, kind of AI proprietary uh, code base or technology? The data set is open source now. Um, I mean, I mean the, the infrastructure or like the code base that you're using. To the code base is not. The code base is not. Okay. Um, yeah. So what it sounds like, this is the, like the core of, of the issue, right? Yes. Like potentially you would be as an individual willing to scale this framework, but there mm -hmm. are, you know, inherent organizational kind of complications that prevent you from, from doing that. Right. right. So I guess like what I was going to get at was in terms of like ultimate design decisions for what the data set uh, looks like and if there are any major changes, I think there is a small team of people, uh, including myself and Lucy, who will be being, basically making these decisions. But in terms of getting eyes onto the data set and identifying issues, 
um, there's just like no way. Uh, there's no better way than to just have a ton of people uh, uh, looking at it, finding like bugs and mistakes and stuff, and then having some system for that feedback to kind of make its way back into the development. And also to open up code for people to basically make pull requests and, and fixes to the code as they see it. Um, Makes sense. Yeah, so what I'm looking into right now is the feasibility for us to basically have the code made of the code for processing the text uh, all made available so that and then have basically like an invitation type system where we invite people to basically fix any things as they come up. Um, the There are certain issues that might uh, there are certain issues that are that I, I haven't entirely thought through about how to how to how to address. Uh, one of which is a lot of this code is fundamentally based off what we have internally in, in Semantic Scholar. Uh, so in terms of running the code, um, so like there are components of, of the pipeline right now that are entirely dependent on being able to run the Semantic Scholar pipeline, um, and there's just like no feasible way to open source that. It's, it's just like five years worth of monstrosity uh, that there's no reasonable way to clean it up such that it's like, it can be open source. So what I'm trying to figure out right now is what components of it are actually safe to rip out and make public. Um, and if it's not the whole thing and it's specific components, can those be modular enough, modular enough such that they can be iterated on without while still like making sense if, if you want. So do you know what I mean? Like that's a little bit tricky um, from a, just a code management perspective. There's also resourcing issues, which is we are expressively prohibited from uh, by publishers to host or make PDFs available to people. Um, and a lot of the processing happens upstream where- In the journal? Yes, uh, mm. yeah. Um, for example, this is why you probably noticed that why uh, if you guys have tried scraping MetaArchive, yeah. MetaCype doesn't have API. And this is the thing. If you look at, there's when one of the things that we've been trying to like articulate is open access or open, open, open access text papers actually has a lot of different tiers to it. Um, and pretty much none of them allow for, even if it's open access, allow for redistribution of the PDFs. Um, this is why even like archive, like regular archive, which you think is like super open, CS, you're not allowed to, to, to basically redistribute the PDFs in archive, but you are allowed to redistribute derived full text from the, from the PDFs, which is kind of why we aren't just dumping yeah. all the PDFs. This is quite crazy. I mean, I, I can't believe that, you know, we're, we're facing this type of uh, situation, but that's the current reality. Yeah. Yes, this is the reality. And we've been basically communicating with these publishers forever. Um, so but it's, this helps it's, a lot, just so, so you understand that was the big missing picture because yeah. we're kind of like messaging you, like trying to understand how to help you. Yeah but we didn't have this uh, valuable context. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so essentially this is one of those things where you basically need to like one-on-one -on -one negotiate with every single provider that we've had partnership with. And if it doesn't work with us, we have to go through another person who maybe has a better connection with them. And then that's kind of like, for example, um, our meta archive, archive papers, we don't have a good relationship with them, but CZI does. And so we're, going through CZI to then negotiate with meta archive people to then get the data. It's like Let me ask kind you this. of nonsense. Um, in terms of, and you know, you, again, like this call is recording and will be published on, on YouTube, but what kind of yeah. relationship, public relationship do we have in terms of policymakers and regulators um, to, you know, help with any of these relationships? Um, I guess I don't quite. Let me rephrase understand. that. Yeah. How much does White House influence any of these journals? I don't know if the I don't know if this is a White House thing. Uh, I think this is a publisher thing. Uh, I have a question around that. So it, uh, it sounds like a part of it is just that it's so much legwork in terms of trying to talk to each of the individual publishers and trying to negotiate in terms of what what can be. Um, if, if that's accurate, is, is that the kind of a thing? So. It's, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is about. I think it is legwork, and I think it's not just legwork, but it's also like, what is the argument? Um, when right. you try to when you try to make these things open, what are the details with respect to that license that that they make yeah. it open with? Um, so, like, 
are they allowed to retract those papers uh, once retract access to those papers once at some defined point in time? Um, what's the language around the releasing of that, uh, of those papers? For example, Elsevier's license is, uh, I remember some people from, uh, were looking at the Elsevier license and there was like a clause that says something around that uh, Elsevier will reserve the right to, to basically, like this life, these are open access until like while well, this page is up, but we don't know when that will disappear. So, um, which sort of like makes it, some people hesitant as to whether they want to like devote time developing for that. Right. That makes uh, sense. Pull a paper. So it's like everyone, like it's not just a matter of like getting humans to talk to them. It's like actually having the right arguments and knowing how, what sort of situation you want. Um, and even if you manage to like negotiate a very specific thing for each publisher, when you organize a large data set like this, people who are just trying to use text to, to do stuff, they don't want to know that they need to have like a giant if statement that says like, if the paper comes from this, I need to do this, da, da, da. Like the organizer data set has to try to make this as simple as possible for people to consume. And so there becomes those complications too. So um, yeah, a lot of it is, is really just like thinking through exactly what sort of long-term vision is and even decisions, if you want decisions for like, constructing data set for which you want the payoff to be in a year or in the next few months or like five, 10 years in front, all of those license and negotiations will, will look different. Um, so that's probably something that's going to have to come maybe from like a, at like a organization mission level. For example, like uh, from our perspective, uh, we definitely super want to help with the, the COVID-19 efforts. Um, but when we talk about like negotiations and stuff, we are really, we're, we are also looking for like maybe the next virus pandemic, maybe the like just general open accessing indefinitely into the future. And our, mm. um, how do we do negotiations where it's kind of urgent, but we also kind of want to right. get that to, to, to apply sort of for years down the road. And yeah, that's that a sense. little bit tougher. Um, One of the things that, that could potentially be, I mean, depending on how the team works around, around transparency and such. But, but because we've got a lot of people who are really engaged in creative problem solving, that mm -hmm. even if it was simply having you know, a channel where we can talk about like, here's some of the frank bottlenecks that are there in terms of being able to, to get the data, either get the data out or any of those kind of pieces. Um, and we're, we're always happy to throw, to throw energy, to, to throw kind of brain power and time at trying to about what some reasonable solutions would be with all of the different wrinkles that are there. Um, yeah, I think for, for this, um, I'll see if we can set up some time with Sebastian. He's super busy, but he's sort of our person who handles uh, partnerships. So mm -hmm. that's what we're like, that's like, in terms of like That'll the data perfect. set design and research side, that's like me and Lucy and Sebastian is sort of our partnership who is dialogue with like the people who are providing data and stuff. Awesome, um, so that, would be, that would be incredibly helpful I bet. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Kyle, is this the person uh, who is particularly focusing on this initiative or, or the institute-wise partnership person? He's, he is our semantic scholar, like senior mm. business person who runs the things. And okay. so, yes. Perfect. Yeah, it would be great yeah. to talk to him definitely. Okay. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for this insight. It's actually very important for us to understand what, yeah. what's actually, what's limiting you what conditions you're working with. And I remember, you know, Tom, when, whenever we, we had the first contact on the messenger, uh, you mentioned that you might potentially have some ideas how can we be helpful with COVID. And could you give us a little bit more insight on that? Tom? Hey. You're Tom, muted. You're, you're, you're on mute. You're muted. Can you actually repeat that question? Oh yeah, yeah. And the question is, um, remember when we exchanged messages on the messenger, on the, um, uh, you actually mentioned that uh, there might be potentially opportunities to, to help you with uh, COVID as far as I understood. So could you provide a little bit more insight on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's something we can discuss, but I think if you can give me some sort of specs of what entities, what uh, information you currently extract, uh, I could take a look and uh, see if it's uh, if it helps us. That would be great. That's one uh, avenue. We, I, I, I think we can start with that, and uh, it'll be great to discuss uh, some more. 
And one other thing I just wanted to toss out, um, Kyle, you mentioned there's a couple of other teams that are out there that also have their enriched data sets that they're working with. Mm -hmm. um, we, we would love to know, you know, we'd be happy to get in touch with any of them to see if there's any, any merging or anything that's useful to do between those different kinds of enrichment we're doing, or whether we're just each reinventing the same wheel. Uh, sure, I think the best way to facilitate that is, so I'm debating, it's probably gonna happen, but I'm debating uh, opening up a, like a new Core 19 work, Slack workspace. Um, I was avoiding it before because Slack is very immediate. It's like a really urgent, like, like I gotta pay attention mm. to this thing, this thing. Uh, but it seems like that's probably the best way to deal with this. And so getting everyone in that workspace so that they can talk um, is sort of what I'm leaning towards. You can actually create a shared Slack channel and invite people only to it. Uh, the only reason how you can't do that is because the, the way that Slack does security, um, our IT team has to approve every single addition mm, onto okay. the AIT station. Okay. channel. So I just like to save them the bother of hitting enter for every single person, I just created a new one. That was, okay. that was the problem from before when we were trying to set Makes up our sense. Slack thing, yeah. Um, I really apologize. I have a cold conflict and I'll have to jump off, but you no guys feel free sure. to, to proceed. All right. Thanks, yeah, guys. we'll just finalize it. I, th I think we discussed most of the things. And... Um, yeah, just for me to understand, I guess I'm not technical, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. Anton, uh, do you understand the ask from Tom in terms of providing the list of entities we extract so that he, he can have a look on that? Well, we'll definitely have to ex ex expand on this one. But so far, again, what, what I see is like a, this huge overlap is like the data set that after all of this legwork of partnerships, yada, yada, all of that gatekeeping, past that, right? Whatever AI two people are doing, essentially, uh, from that end, like, we definitely could make this, like, two-way communication work. And so far, yeah, I kind of get it, what, what is needed. It's, I think, like, next week, mm -hmm. uh, I will definitely have a good idea what, in terms of this enrichment data we have. Because right now, again, we did first submission, we only, like, it's all in this disjoint format. But we already, like this week, we launched our like Elasticsearch Dataverse repo to essentially make it all like infrastructure based, et cetera. So I think mm -hmm. from there, we could have really solid communication in terms of what we have and, you know, be built on top of that. Right. Another um, um, potentially important way uh, you could help is that we, we'd like to see how useful the things we build, such as COVAs, are uh, mm -hmm. to experts. Um, I don't know what the best way you can suggest is to go about that, but say I'm uh, trying to think, you know, one way would be to get a call and then see who's interested and, and then dig deeper emails. Uh, discourse page, uh, or even a Slack with some experts that maybe we can uh, be more have a more free discussion. Um, yeah. that's that's another important avenue where you could potentially uh, help us. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, yeah. it, it could. I don't know if any of these experts have time, but maybe the more junior ones would be able to help also with uh, like we give them some sort of uh, output and they mm -hmm. uh, tell us, you know, go. Uh, mm -hmm. down a spreadsheet or something like that and say, okay, this looks good, it doesn't look good, according to whatever criteria, you know, uh, annotation tasks. So yeah. that would be another potential use. I don't know if you have, if you have people like yeah, yeah, we do have people. available. Great. We, we, we have not just the people, but we're, we're beginning to have a whole kind of a, a workflow that we're coming up with around how to do exactly that. Um, we're also beginning to establish increased connection to some of the different some of the different researchers that are out there are some of the different aspects of the medical community. So, so that could be a strong place where we can. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think like there's two, really, there's really like two different levels. The high level, the more senior people would be great if they have time to just discuss what's, what is needed, uh, help us write some initial documents, an internal document, I mean, just to gather all kinds of leads and directions from the uh, people who actually would maybe need these tools. And secondly, the, the, on the, I guess the slightly more junior, probably the more junior um, experts could maybe help uh, annotating stuff. 
Uh, maybe it's not the junior experts. Maybe uh, people just want to help, and that would be great. But in, anyone who has time, uh, that's another uh, potentially useful uh, avenue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll have a look. And um, yeah, but just a quick question on my end. When when you when you were asking about the usefulness of COVID tool for experts, you meant you meant the medical experts, right? Not the not the data scientists. Yeah, yeah. Only um, okay. I'm strictly speaking about biomed experts. You know, and, and that's also diverse. There's the specifically there's the molecular areas, which you know also subfields there, and then there's a clinical uh, with sub feels but you know, if we could just start with that kind of segmentation mm -hmm. i think that could be Perfect. useful maybe the, and, uh, yeah okay so Sorry, regarding I'm, like I'm, regarding uh kind of like this to expand in terms of proper channels of having really good like uh this feedback from medical community medical experts like it will definitely take a couple of weeks from now because sure. right now we essentially do the like essentially first try we do it like essentially manually For per task we find some experts that will you know kind of guiding us in terms of our like Kaggle competition submissions but now what we do we we put all of that like in on a like proper solid infrastructure like backend so it will take some time and then again as, as we reach out to medical community, again, building the infrastructure geared towards them to, you know, give us that feedback. So eventually I think we will send, I definitely see that synergy between our efforts and what you guys need in terms of feedback on what data is there. We will definitely have that. Um, I had a, sorry, I had a separate question. I don't know if that's a good time to ask. Go well, ahead, it is, it is. Um, do you guys have a sense of what, what sort of the end goal is for Corona Y? Like what's, what's like a target thing that you guys are trying to achieve? So um, a, key, a key piece of what we're looking at, I mean, right now, really the, the bullseye of the target is maximum impact on COVID-19. So we're within the Kaggle challenge context, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to participate in rounds two and, and to put something forward there that's impressive. But really what we're looking for is how, how can we best set up a solid pipeline throughout COVID-19 of getting in the questions that we should be asking, sourcing the data that we should be using, creating the different uh, code that we can be using for that, open sourcing each element of that so that others can also be using it, and then liaising to ideally both the medical community and policy community so that those findings can be useful. And then beyond COVID-19, we are, we are looking at, well, you know, what about the next pandemic? What about um, generally some of the, one of the things we're learning a lot about as we work on this is the different ways in which collaboration is challenging within the medical community. Um, and we're looking at what are some of the different tools that we can be applying long-term and more generally within, within that medical context as well. Yeah. Basically, uh, to add on top of Daniel's comments, you know, uh, Kyle, that's why, that's why one of the questions uh, in the agenda was to understand what are the bigger ambitious goals for AI2R, because as, as we mentioned, we are not uh, seeing uh, to, 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 to finish the things after the coronavirus related challenge is done. We see that it's only going to multiply because we have this framework, this community of the scientists, um, uh, medical experts and others, and we are going to uh, leverage as much as possible to to the bigger goal. So uh, that's why we, we, we are open to uh, some kind of strategic collaborations with with the institute as well and with other entities. If there are bigger challenges which can be resolved, we are happy to look into that. So if you if you know someone, uh, you mentioned this person, uh, Sebastian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who is friendly collaboration. If, if you know someone else to, uh, if you would like us to, con to, to connect with someone else as well, regarding the, you know, longer term strategic partnerships, we're absolutely uh, uh, open and would be thankful for that. Okay. Um, Sebastian's good to talk to. Let me think about who else would be good here. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of just like general impact. Um, yeah, you guys are in a very interesting space. So like with 900 people, mm -hmm. With 900 people, so like, for example, uh, AI2 has what? Tom, how many people do you have in AI2? Like 200? Uh, I think so. At yeah. most, right, yeah. yeah. And so 
with 200 organizations already starting to get pretty tough in terms of like connecting with like what other groups are doing yeah. groups mm -hmm. mostly operate on their own individual project with like it's it's hard to like have structure to facilitate right dialogue between groups and they sort of focus on you start having a lot of sub problems that you're you're looking at so i can only imagine that with 900 that's going to to have with the with the goal of just like impact on virus pandemics covid-19 or future there's just going to be a whole bunch of different things going on um so i guess i'm trying to just understand like wh what's I think it's easier to think about when there is scoping of things that you guys don't want to do. Do you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, yeah. if there's a starting to be elimination of like, we don't really care about this kind of, this kind of stuff or this direction. Um, and just to get a sense of where the priorities are, for example, uh, there are definitely uh, one big question on my mind would be um, timeline for, for results and impact. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, there are a lot of shared tasks right now uh, that are being organized. Um, uh, we're also we're, we're organizing a information retrieval shared task with TREC. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one of those things where we want to organize a, a, um, a long-term challenge for retrieving relevant documents um, related to like, like the COVID-19 virus pandemic. But this is one of the things where to organize a, a challenge that you can use to evaluate all of these systems you're not going to have immediate short-term impact. By a time that these systems are developed that can do retrieve these, answer these questions really well, we already know the answer to these questions. It's already going to be like October or November. But that's something that we sort of discussed and we were okay with because we were hoping that the learnings would be more long-term, maybe applicable to like future virus pandemics, even if it doesn't really uh, help anything for this current one. So that's like the sort of decisions that I would kind of be curious if you guys yeah. uh, have like, discussed or made, some in, made any concrete decisions around. Um, that makes sense. One, one of the things that's a really interesting, um, it, it's, it's the double-edged sword of the, kind, the nature of what an organization like Corona Y is, um, is that we are much more like an anti-hive than we are like a typical corporation. So we're, we're not very waterfall, we're very agile. And so rather than there being a, a, a key board that says, okay, this, this is the thing we're gonna be focused on, everybody look this way. Um, it's more that, we're providing the structure and we're bringing in the people where we're able to aggregate the data and the code that can have an impact. Mm -hmm. um, we have our task teams that form, but the way that they form is more, somebody has an idea. They say, this would be a thing that would be good to work on. A few people may gravitate around that. If that begins to get enough sufficient energy, um, they can then propose like, this looks like something that we should really be following. This looks like something that would be worthwhile to, to be pursuing at that point. You know, then they get, they get you know, here's your Slack channel, here's your Trello, here's your resources, so that we can try to be looking at that. <laughs> so the, the disadvantage is it's, it, it's hard and can make it seem extremely disorganized in terms of saying, like, what's, what's the thing that you're shooting for? The advantage of it is that it means that it's pretty easy for us to rapidly put things together and to pivot quickly in, multi, in multiple different directions. So even within this, the top four tasks we were looking at for the Kaggle Challenge, <laughs> there were several different small pivots and sub teams that came out, which then some of them ended up merging back together in, in useful ways. So okay. Let me give you a specific example, Carl, so you can kind of see how it happens out of multiple actions that, that happened within Corona Y. Uh, at some point, uh, some of our, again, medical experts start to ask in us like, oh, guys, uh, this data we're looking at, like, is it validated where, where it's coming from, right? Yeah. So we got this question is like, okay, how do we validate data or something? And it was, you know, specific day of the week. And on my end, I start at the same time, I was just searching through all of the different uh, design docs that our people, like people within our community are creating in proposals. And I'm finding out the document where the guy already for like almost a week, he was asking this question, like how we validate this data. He went through all of the, across our four main teams and the NLP like core team and visualization team and was essentially doing all of that groundwork. So we, at that point, we already had uh, like this initial first design doc, what we actually need to be done in this regard. And now, could we act on it immediately? No, but like today, for example, like fast forward to today, 
we had a call with tech team essentially building that search engine that we kind of briefly discussed earlier, right? And we immediately had this specific like plan how to start acting on terms of, okay, we already know what type of, you know, kind of fields to, to validate, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, the follow-up questions for that was, okay, if we validate the data, like what is the like acknowledgement, where the data coming from, is it cited properly, yada, yada. And then turns out we have another person already did that work. So we had a lot of actions like this that is essentially this, oh my God, it's just a chaos or something. But the moment when we ask the right questions and we move in, in the specific direction, you immediately see that we have all the ingredients. And I think we're already at the point that we find the formula that works, that we have the ingredients, we have like, we could afford to have multiple kitchens, so we never run into problem of multiple cooks in the same kitchen. So it just, you know, the question to act on, on this type of stuff. And in terms of, for example, what I, I already kind of get from this conversation is, yeah, we have a lot of areas that we overlap with you guys, mm -hmm. right? So it's, the question is like, okay, we just need to start communicating more and then synchronizing. And then we will find a dedicated team within our community that you know, uh, essentially mm -hmm. should be probably part of volunteering workforce for AI too, just there under mm -hmm. our roof, but we'll figure out how to, to make it all work. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's, it's extremely unorthodox. Uh, coming from, uh, from a corporate environment, I must say it's very unorthodox, <laughs> but it's working. The magic is that it's working. It, it seems to be scalable. And it seems that we have a lot more potential in front of us, which is great. I mean, because uh, on the other hand, we are not limited. We are not limited by uh, by a chain of command or like um, uh, general uh, direction or stuff like that. We are kind of uh, just choosing from the, in many cases, we are just choosing from the multiple um, uh, solutions of the same problem, which is more sufficient, which is kind of duplication on one end, but on the other end, it's kind of natural selection of the best ideas. So it's like, yeah, it's still a young um, uh, organization, coronavirus. But uh, it's very impressive, even in this stage, I must say. Yeah. So let's try. And basically, uh, I made notes, guys, and I'll put this into just short summary. And basically, we'll try to address your questions and uh, bring you some resources to help. Hopefully, it will be helpful with COVID as well in terms of refining it, making it very much useful. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this call. So we have two minutes left, just in case anyone has any short topic or, you know, questions. The last piece that I'd throw out is to say, to, to get kind of a sense of what we're talking about in, in terms of that, the way that we're organized, if there, if there ends up being something or other that you would want to toss over to Corona Y and say like, like, would you all be able to bite this off? Is this something that, uh, that would be uh, something you could help with? That'll give us a chance to, to sort of see how are we able to aggregate around the kind of things that could be useful to AI too um, and, and see what we're able to do. Yeah, absolutely. So feel free to, to, to that, think about any it. challenges. Just be open. We are very much open to the ideas and sometimes you will be amazed with the fresh things we might bring to the table. Cool. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you no, very much. So much. And yeah. Let's thanks connect. Thanks everyone. Hopefully. All right. Thank Peace. you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Too. Bye.